Today, we will learn and reflect on the writings of St. Augustine and the Stoic philosopher Masonius Rufus on concupiscence. What is concupiscence? Concupiscence exists when we do not truly love our friends and neighbors, but rather use them for our selfish profit or pleasure. You may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder the question of concupiscence? We all expect to benefit from our friendships. We expect or hope that our friends will act like friends, and we are devastated when our lovers love for us sours and turns into hatefulness. As St. John the Cross teaches us, we should be careful in choosing our close friends. Our love for our close friends should increase in us our love for God and our other neighbors. If each close friend places their friend's interest ahead of their own, then their friendship will be a blessed friendship indeed. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video and my blogs that also cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. St. Augustine's most famous quote made before his ultimate conversion was a prayer to God. Please, Lord, grant me chastity, but not yet. This shows that St. Augustine was quite human, just like us, and quite honest about his struggles with intimacy. We must not forget that St. Paul and the early church fathers lived in a Greek culture. St. Augustine tells us in his confessions that he experienced a double conversion from the false philosophies of Manichaeans. First, he experienced a conversion to the transcendent ideas of the Platonists, which prepared him for his second conversion to Christianity. The Platonic and Stoic philosophers rejected crass hedonism, and instead striving to live a life in moderation, controlling the passions, seeking to improve the soul and the state, and these both greatly influenced Christianity. We in the modern world instinctively dislike St. Augustine's and Rufus's teaching on concupiscence, but that tells us more about ourselves than St. Augustine and the Stoics. For the modern Freudian worldview tends to err on the side of hedonism, letting loose our deepest passions, lest they devour us, whereas the ancient Stoics and Church Fathers stress instead a life of prayer and obedience, controlling the passions, encouraging the virtues. Putting this in another way, Professor uh, Philip Carey, and he's a professor with the teaching company with the Great Courses, and he posits that the difference in the worldview between the ancient and modern world means that the ancient anxieties differ from the modern anxieties. The ancients did not live in large cities. They lived closer to nature and closer to the wild beasts that could possibly tear them to pieces, especially if they went out at night. So the ancient anxiety is that our passions would rule us so we would become like the wild beasts. This fear is reflected in the many stories of Greek heroes like Hercules fighting fierce beasts like the Hydra in this painting, and the myth of Theseus fighting the half-man, half-bull, minotaur beast. The modern anxiety, we see that in movies like the 2001 Space Odyssey and the Terminator series. So the modern anxiety is we will be cold and uncaring like the unfeeling computers we interact with on a daily basis. We also see this different point of view by contrasting the half-man creatures in the ancient and the modern world. The Greek myths often describe a half-man, half-horse creature known as centaurs in many Greek myths, as we can see in this mosaic found in Hadrian's villa of centaurs fighting pure beasts. One modern description of a half-man creature is the Borgs in the Star Trek series, who captured Captain Picard and turned him into a half-man, half-droid composite. And also Darth Vader, who the movie tells us is more machine than man. And of course we can't forget R2, D2, and C-3PO droids that seem almost human. Our error is we instinctively assume that the past 20 centuries are just like our 20th centuries, and nothing can be further from the truth. If Christians from ancient Rome, from St. Augustine time, were able to peek forward 15 centuries, they would be awestruck and, dumb, and dumbfounded. Life is much more unimaginably better than anything they could ever imagine. 
Marriage in the ancient world was for bearing children, not for love, because marriage was a serious business in the ancient world. The, the infant mortality rate was sky high. Most infants didn't live out their first year, and those who survived often died before the age of 10. The ancients had no aspirin. Children and adults often both died from fever. Many women died in childbirth, and often wealthy women updated their wills when they learned they became pregnant. Marrying for love is a modern luxury. The thought of going to a sterile and safe modern hospital with anesthesia and surgical staff on hand to deliver a little Johnny would have been totally unimaginable to the ancient Christians. Faced with the risks of childbirth, many ancient cultures chose abstention rather than risk the life of the wife. We cannot fault the ancient Christians for their views on love and marriage and insisting that these risks are best justified in the bearing of children. We can thank God that we live in a day when love and marriage is indeed blissful and with greatly reduced medical risks. Although the Latin word concupiscence means the using of others solely for personal pleasure or advantage, this concept definitely is at the core of Stoic philosophy. The belief that physical intimacy is wrong outside of marriage and that within marriage should be restricted to the begetting of children was first taught not by St. Augustine, but by the Stoic philosophers, Masonius Rufus in particular. Epictetus, whose sayings often echo Masonius Rufus, his teacher and mentor, and often repeat what Masonius Rufus taught, talks about the passions thus. It is enough for animals to eat and drink and copulate and do all the other things they do. But for men, whom God has given the intellectual faculty, these things are not sufficient. For unless we act in a proper and orderly manner, conforming to our nature, we shall never attain our true end. Controlling the passions is a common Stoic teaching. Seneca and Marcus Aurelius also advise us to control our passions. Many who denigrate St. Augustine for his overly strict attitudes on intimacy and concupiscence did not realize that he was repeating merely what Stoic philosophers taught. Rufus gives us advice that is very similar to the teachings of St. Augustine. Men who are neither licentious nor wicked must consider only those intimate acts between husband and wife for the creation of children to be right and lawful. But intimate acts that chase after mere pleasure, even in marriage, are wrong and unlawful. But you may ask, what if nobody is hurt by these acts of pleasure? Rufus maintains everyone who acts wrongly and unjustly, even if it doesn't hurt those near to him, immediately shows himself to be entirely base and dishonorable. What Rufus and St. Augustine are saying to us is simply we should not use another person solely for our pleasure. We in the modern world should feel blessed that modern medicine ensures that our wives are not risking their lives every time they bear our children. This advice would not sound so draconian if we were living in ancient times. Rufus sounds more like St. Paul in his next lecture on marriage, where he says that the purpose of marriage is children and that they should consider all things as common possession and nothing as private, not even the body itself. Although children are important to marriage, there must also be companionship and care of the husband and wife for each other, both in sickness and in health and on every occasion. The church teaches that marriage is a monastic calling and Rufus agrees. Rufus says that when this mutual care is complete, each spouse competes to surpass the other in giving such care. Such a marriage is admirable and deserves emulation. Such a partnership is beautiful. But when one or both spouses are selfish rather than selfless, when they neglect the concerns of their spouse, they either break apart completely from each other or their marriage is worse than solitude. Souls that are naturally disposed toward self-control and justice, or in other words, virtue, they are obviously the souls most suitable for marriage. Although concupiscence usually refers to close friendships and intimate relationships, a broader view of concupiscence is that it is about controlling the appetites and our habits. And the first habit to control is our eating habits. Rufus agrees with the early church fathers, whose monastic rules constantly stress the spiritual benefits that flow from controlling your appetites and denying the belly. Rufus remembers how Socrates said that while most men live to eat, he eats to live. Likewise, Rufus says, gluttony is nothing other than lack of self-control with respect to food, and people prefer pleasant-tasting food to nutritious foods. Also, mastering one's appetite for food and drink is the beginning and basis of self-control. 
Rufus prefers food that you can eat without cooking like fruits and vegetables, milk, cheese, and honeycombs. And he prefers simple food over gourmet meals and sweets. A meat-based diet is too crude for humans and is more suitable for wild beasts. Well, we don't have to go with that last bit of advice, but that's what he advises. Similarly, the early church fathers encouraged fasting for meat on Wednesdays and Fridays and during Lent and many other fa fast weeks on the church calendar. Many people mistakenly think fasting means abstaining from food completely for a long period of time, but that is not the teaching of the church. Fasting means eating in moderation, eating only what is necessary, and abstaining from certain foods according to the church calendar. And in modern times, this is practiced by the Orthodox Church mainly. Likewise, Rufus advises us that the man who wants to live a godly life must not only learn the lessons which pertain to virtue, but train himself to follow them eagerly and rigorously. The philosopher has to train both his soul and body by enduring hardships and not giving in to pleasures, but instead we should accustom ourselves to cold, heat, thirst, hunger, scarcity of food, hardness of bed, abstaining from pleasures, and enduring pain. Rufus continues, the person who is practicing to become a philosopher exercises self-discipline, so he does not welcome pleasure and avoid pain, so that he won't love living and fear death, and in the case of money, so he won't honor receiving over giving. The man who wants to be good must not only learn the lessons which pertain to virtue, but must train himself to follow them eagerly and rigorously. So we can see that what Masonius Rufus advises us regarding concupiscence is actually stricter and more severe than the teachings of St. Augustine. In contrast with the Stoic philosophers and the Eastern Church Fathers, who were mostly celibate monks, St. Augustine was a bishop who preached and counseled the laymen, many of whom were married in the parishes of his diocese, which meant that St. Augustine was more attuned to the spiritual needs of the many married people in the pews. St. Augustine starts his work on the good of marriage with a discussion of how marriage is first a friendship in the bonds of family and a friendship between man and wife, friends who walk together side by side, raising children, growing old together. St. Augustine is a bit harsher in his work on marriage and concupiscence. There he teaches that in matrimony, let those nuptial blessings be the objects of our love, offspring, fidelity, the sacramental bond. This sacramental bond is meant to be ever-enduring, lost neither by divorce nor by adultery, and should be guarded by husband and wife with concord and charity. St. Augustine ends this paragraph with a conclusion that many modern readers would hesitate concluding, and I doubt if St. Augustine were to be alive today he would put it this way, but even so, we should be open to the message for his application to modern man. And he says, Carnal concupiscence must not be ascribed to marriage. It is only to be tolerated in marriage. It is not a good which comes out of the essence of marriage, but an evil which is the accident of original sin. In my opinion, this teaching of St. Augustine is tremendously influenced by the fact that in the ancient world, women faced you know, tremendous risks, and indeed risked their lives, when they became pregnant and uh, went through childbirth. Now, how can we imagine that St. Augustine might rephrase this if he were alive today? Perhaps he would assert that although physical intimacy is the glue that holds marriage together and provides the children which bring joy into our lives, that this physical intimacy must not be the most important thing in our relationship. What must be more important is friendship and parenthood and emotional intimacy and our love for God. These all should come first. And our love for our spouse should enable all our other loves for our neighbors to become stronger. But if physical intimacy is the only glue holding our marriage together, all we would have is one big sticky mess, a mucky tar baby. When discussing concupiscence, the book of Ruth provides an illustration. There are few truly happy marriages in the Old Testament. One shining example is the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. The story goes like this. Naomi, who would become Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi and her husband moved from Judea to Moab to escape a famine, and their two sons married two Moabite women. But over the years she became destitute when first her husband, then her two sons, one after the other, died. Naomi, in desperation, decided to move back to Judea, although she had lost touch with her relatives. She tries to convince her daughters-in-law to stay and remarry local men, but Ruth, showing character, refuses to leave Naomi. 
And this is one of the most touching verses in Scripture. But Ruth said to Naomi, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Now, Jewish law states that when farmers harvest their grain, they must leave behind sheaves of grain, so those who are destitute can glean the grain. The owner of the field, Boaz, notices the graceful beauty of Ruth as she gleans in the fields, and he instructs his workers to leave behind extra sheaves of grain for Ruth to glean. To truly understand the story, we must remember that the ancient Hebrews saw the Moabite women as somewhat loose. Perhaps St. Augustine himself, if he were alive today, would point out that the concept of physical intimacy is always damnable before marriage, but always blessed and blissful after marriage is a very shallow view of the virtue of marriage. Nobody among neither the ancients nor the moderns can deny the value of both spouses announcing their fidelity to each other in marriage. St. Augustine admits that concupiscence should be tolerated in marriage, a death that should be honored, his message for us today is whether before or after marriage, the doubt raised by physical intimacy is whether we are using the other for our physical pleasure, and we can never really be sure whether we are or not. Since we are less in danger of putting our spouse at risk and physical harm today than in the ancient world, deeming this a venial sin is not helpful. But regarding our passions as venial faults can be helpful, particularly if awareness of our venial faults leads us to humility and love for our spouse seeking to put their needs over ours, seeking to serve rather than to abuse our spouses, being ever aware that we hold their hearts in our hands. Naomi notices the attention Boaz is paying to her beautiful daughter-in-law, Ruth, and this can be seen in the facial expressions in this painting by Bertram. We must remember how exposed women were in the ancient world. If they had no property, they were quite exposed. Their only hope would be to find someone who would marry and protect them, which would have been impossible for an older widow like Naomi. So, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. He's going to be all by himself. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Then she said to her, All that you tell me I will do. Okay. Uncover his feet. Two big feet, or maybe two big feet and a small third foot. This is common usage and a common question in many languages and cultures, including the ancient Hebrew language and culture. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. And I think he's speaking of her, her relationship with Naomi. For you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. He must be thinking to himself, Oh, what a lucky dog am I. So what happened that night? If you were the original audience hearing the story for the very first time, your interpretation may be at variance with all the classical rabbinic and Christian commentators. For all these commentators affirm that Ruth did not sacrifice her chastity that night. She spent alone with Boaz at the wine press all night long. Uh, of course, the commentators had to interpret these verses thus. We don't want to encourage any young men to take advantage of the young ladies in the pews. 
St. Augustine, like all church fathers, starts from scriptures in his teachings on concupiscence, and particularly St. Paul. And in Corinth, there were some overly strict Gnostic ascetics in the early church, and St. Paul corrects them in 1 Corinthians 7, affirming that, yes, intimacy is godly. And St. Paul says, it is well for a man not to touch a woman, but because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, perhaps by agreement, for a set time to devote yourself to prayer, but then come back together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And he goes on, saying that this is by way of concession, not of command. I wish that all were like I was. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I am. But if they are not practicing self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. A modern man in his interpretation of this may go heavy on the marital duties and light on the prayer aspect of the marital relationship, but the ancient Christians valued prayer much more highly, and we can see this in the book of Tobit. Are these quotes from St. Augustine in reality an extreme? So we will study some more quotes. St. Augustine teaches that here the Apostle Paul permits the married couple intercourse for purposes other than begetting children. Although evil habits impel them to such intercourse, yet marriage guards them from adultery or fornication. For these sins are not committed because of marriage, but are pardoned because of marriage. This is permitted so each spouse can sustain the weakness of the other. If perpetual continence be pleasing to one of them, they may not, save with the consent of the other. Now, we may object to the phrase evil habits. Perhaps St. Augustine today would use the term pernicious habits or not say anything at all, which is today is a good phrase because we certainly wish to be on guard against using our spouse solely for our own pleasure, lest we, sink, lest we risk that our marriage sink into a state of a single client brothel. Now this comment may sound harsh, but a marriage without purpose may not last, particularly a marriage where the couple has been married for many years and have no plans for children. They spend their time entertaining, the wife doesn't want the wife to work, the wife is okay with not having their own career, they let their lives drift at sea with no shore in sight, no life preservers, living only to party, living for food and liquor and pleasure, and you wonder, what is the point? What purpose does their life have? Where can they find fulfillment or purpose and salvation in such a banal existence, an existence without children, droning on year after year after year? Who will take care of them when they're old? Here, Vatican II and Pope John Paul II uses the language of Kant in teaching that we should respect the dignity of the person of our spouse, that we should never use one another just for pleasure or any other benefit, that in marriage we should always act for the benefit of the other, of our spouse, that we have a categorical imperative to live according to our moral duty, regardless of the consequences, regardless of whether or not this benefits ourselves that we should always respect the personhood and preciousness of our neighbor. In this way we love our neighbor as ourselves. In this way we love, likewise love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. For our salvation lives in living our lives for others rather than living our lives only thinking of ourselves. Those who are saved do not keep scorecards noting when their friends or spouses help them last. Similarly, modernity would shudder at the following teaching of St. Augustine, but here our beloved saint can teach us as much as he taught the ancient Romans. Intercourse of marriage for the sake of getting children has no fault, and intercourse in the marital bed to satisfy lust has but venial fault. But intercourse in adultery or fornication is a deadly fault. Rather than reject this passage with a knee-jerk, we should first seek to understand what St. Augustine means when he says venial. The footnote for marriage and concupiscence has an interesting footnote. The Latin word for permission is venia, which also means indulgence, forbearance, forgiveness. And so the sins that might be forgiven are called venial sins, i.e. pardonable sins. And in this narrow sense that St. Augustine is using the word, permissible sins. 
So, what distinguishes venial sins from mortal sins? The venial sin, St. Augustine warns us against in his earlier work on the good of marriage, evolves into a stronger warning against venial sins committed in the marriage bed in his work on marriage and concupiscence, written in response to the laxity of the Pelagian heresy. St. Augustine, at the end of his life, penned a work called Retractions, where he explains some misunderstandings that people have when trying to interpret his works. And he mentions in Retractions that he wants to add a clarification to these works. And he teaches us, We maintain that marriage is good, and that it must not be supposed that the concupiscence of the flesh, or quoting from Romans 7.23, that the law in our members which wears against the law of our mind is the fault of marriage. Conjugal chastity makes a good use of the evil of concupiscence in the procreation of children. We may find this hard to believe, but in the time of St. Augustine there were those who argued that marriage itself was a sin. But St. Augustine in rebuttal assures us that marriage is indeed not a sin. Rather, St. Augustine teaches, we ought not to condemn marriage because of the evil of lust, nor must we praise lust because of the good of marriage. Indeed, St. Augustine reminds us that marriage is sacramental, until death do we part. Indeed, we should be happy that our beloved St. Augustine equates meals and food with physical intimacy. For as we cannot survive without food, so the human race cannot survive without begetting of children, and both have a certain carnal delight delights that are best enjoyed when we avoid excessive binges. As St. Augustine teaches, from whatever source men be born, if they do not follow the vices of their parents, but rather worship God and lead a godly life, they will be honest and safe. For the seed of man, whoever his parents may be, is the creation of God. Interestingly, in his retractions, St. Augustine's offers as an addition that the good and right use of lust in marriage is not lust, but rather a good use of the will. And he, as you can see, he has several retractions to these particular works. Certainly concupiscence, which is the selfish using of another for your own pleasure, is presumed in relationship where there's no commitment of marriage, most definitely when there is adultery. But can the venial sin of concupiscence exist in a marriage between faithful loving partners? Certainly, if the husband and wife are truly loving and are truly friends and are both truly unselfish, perhaps concupiscence may be impossible. But how can there be physical intimacy without some degree of selfishness? And the answer is, there's always doubt there. So, in return, there should always be humility. There should always be repentance and forgiveness for sins both seen and unseen. For no relationship on earth is perfect, particularly when the passions and desires bind the relationship together for better or for worse. St. Augustine certainly agrees that we should not possess our spouse in the disease of carnal concupiscence. But then he adds that we should not understand this to mean that the apostle prohibited conjugal cohabitation, which is lawful and honorable, and that this must not be a matter of the will, but of necessity. St. Augustine further teaches that in marriage, concupiscence should not control us, but we should control concupiscence, bridling and restraining its rage. For what is most important to St. Augustine is that believers bear children in a loving home, so they can be born again in Christ and remain with him forever. St. Augustine teaches us, carnal concupiscence is not a good which comes out of the essence of marriage, but it is an evil which is the accident of original sin. If our children are accidents, if our children are unloved, if our children are unwanted, then this lustful cruelty in our children, so reluctantly begotten, unmasks our sins, practice in darkness, dragging them out into the light of day. Certainly the main lesson is that the church teaches us that what gives marriage purpose is the bearing of children, so we do not live our life for ourselves. Salvation is the purpose of marriage the salvation of our children, the salvation of our spouse, and the working out of our salvation. How does the command to love our neighbor as ourselves work its way out in marriage? We should consider first the good of our children and the living of our lives. Then we should work for the good of our spouse. And then we should take care of ourselves. But we are last. But last of all in a marriage should be concupiscence. But we should not neglect loving kindness and tenderness 
that should pervade all the relationships with our children and between husband and wife. Which brings us back to the story of Ruth, who married Boaz, bore him a son, and gave him many years of happiness. The book of Ruth ends with a song of rejoicing by the women in the village. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. St. Augustine teaches us, Continence is a virtue not of the body, but of the soul. But the virtues of the soul are sometimes slow in work, sometimes lie in habit, as the virtue of martyrdom shone forth and appeared by enduring sufferings. Now, I remember asking my Catholic priest about a divorce support group session where I was a moderator, where I informed the participants that they were in luck, for the Catholic Church was running a special deal. The special deal was this, that if they suffered through a thoroughly trying marriage, they got to skip purgatory, for they suffered sufficient purgation here on earth. I told the priest that some of the participants objected that they thought that this was a very bad joke that was not at all appreciated, so I asked him if he thought my understanding of the theology of purgation was in this instance sound. And the priest said yes, that uh, in this instance uh, purgation was a most sound theology, and enduring to the end a most trying marriage was indeed a sufficient purgatory. Of course, he added, in marriages, the best interests of the children should always trump the best interests of the parents, and the discernments of individual situations always trumps general principles. I remember many years ago attending a pre cana session with a rather liberal material, since superseded, thank God, had a cartoon of a bishop under the bed sheets nosing into the private life of the newlyweds. And I could barely stomach reading the text surrounding the cartoon, but it does kind of sum up the modern attitude towards religion. Religion is okay as long as it's spiritual, but don't preach to us about such private matters as morality. But when reading St. Augustine, he does sound extreme sometimes. What married man is not fantasized about alone time with his wife? Should this married man confess his carnal thoughts? How can you tell whether you love your beloved in a loving manner rather than carnally? Should we worry about whether we love our wife or lust for our wife and whether that is a venial sin? These are questions we can never answer. We are never totally sure about our motivations. Only God can judge with certainty. Perhaps the only answer is that we should always confess daily that we do not love our beloved as we ought, as we can always confess we don't forgive as we ought, or pray ceaselessly as we ought. This is not confession out of guilt, but rather confession as a spiritual discipline that brings us closer to the love of God, to the joy of God's love for us, to our thankfulness for our blessings, and to our sufferings, which bring patience and endurance and salvation through purgation. St. Augustine never preaches guilt. St. Augustine instead preaches love. And St. Augustine teaches that if you truly love God, you can do what you will, for with love all things are possible. St. Augustine pre preaches confession, confession of repentance, confession of forgiveness, confession of faith, confession of hope, and confession of love, and the greatest of these is love. Now we'll talk about some of the sources we have for our videos. We purchased this slim collection of the writings of Masonius Rufus that is very readable from uh, Amazon and it's a very good translation. Uh, we previously released a video on a student, the Epictetus. A former slave of a former slave, or frequently credits Rufus for his wisdom. The Stoic six-pack from Amazon has a very readable translation of the writings of Epictetus. And Professor Luke Timothy Johnson turned me on to reading the Stoic philosophers. We highly recommend these great courses lectures, but they're not on the Great Courses Plus. We are quoting from the writings of St. Augustine on the Good of Marriage, Volume 3 of the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers and on Marriage and Concupiscence in Volume 5, and also uh, the retractions that are printed in those two volumes. These translations were done in 1887. Some of the usage is dated, and they can be a little challenging to read in pieces, but overall they're very readable. Please click on the links below in the description for our blogs on Masonius Rufus and St. Augustine, and please click on the links for other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.